good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's council meeting. Uh, with the usual prayer, please. Creator and sustainer of all things and all people, you are the source of all wisdom and light. Enlighten our mind to receive your guidance so that you may lead us into true wisdom. May all that we say and do in the service of this county, whether as elected members or as an officer, be in accordance with your will and for the good of your people. Amen. I would like to welcome all members and visitors to this council meeting who are joining the meeting online. And I'd just like to do a special welcome to Alderman uh, Mr. Roffey, who is tuning in from his home in Melton Mowbray. As usual, this meeting is being broadcast live via the County Council's website and will be archived so it can be viewed later. To start, I will ask Lauren Haslam to take a roll call of members to make sure all members can see or at least hear everyone else. Lauren, could you do the roll call of members, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, members. Uh, as Kat's mentioned, if you could mute your microphone until I call your name, that will help um, with our sound production and quality. Um, Mr. Barclay. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, I can see and hear. Mr. Bedford. Present. Bentley. Mr. Bentley. Hello? Mr. Bentley. Hello. I'm here. Hill. Mr. Brecken's here. Mr. Bant. Okay. Alter. Yeah. Good afternoon. I think you missed me in the uh, list or I didn't hear it. David Bill. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Uh, yes, I'm here, Lauren. Stuart Bray. Thank you. Mr. Brecken. Yes, here. Thanks, Lauren. Brenda. Dr. Brenda. Yeah, I, I can almost hear you. I'm here present and can see you. Thank you very much. Your microphone keeps going in and out. Can anyone whose name I'm not calling out please um, mute your microphones? I think that will help every other member to hear when I get to call out their name. Um, Mrs. Broadley. Here. Thank you. Mr. Charlesworth. President Lauren. Thank you. Mr. Coxon. Mr. Coxon. Uh. Mr. Coxon here, yes. Thank you. Mr. Crooks. Uh, Dr. Einan. Present. Dr. Feltham. Present. Mrs. Fryer. I'm here and I can see and hear you. Thank you. Mr. Galton. Yes, I'm here, Lauren. Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gillard. Present. Mrs. Hack. Present. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. Here, present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Present. Sorry, I think I might have cut across you with Dr. Hill. Did, they, did you say you were here? I'm here, yes. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Yes, I'm here. I can see you. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Yes, uh, present. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Mr. Licorice. Uh, present, Lauren. Thank you. Mr. Mia. 
I'm Mr. sorry, yeah. I'm Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morgan. I can see and hear you. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. Present. M Mrs. Newton. Present. Okay. Mr. Orson. Present. Mr. Osborne. Mm -hmm. Mr. Osborne. Mr. Old. Yes, uh, I'm here. Ms. Page. I'm here and I can see in here. Good afternoon, all. Mr. Payne. I'm here, Lauren. Mr. Parton. Good afternoon, Lauren. I can see and hear you. Thank Good you, afternoon. Mr. Pearson. Present. Thank you. Mr. Pendleton. Mr. Pendleton. <laughs> yes, I can hear and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fillimore. Present. Thank you. Uh, hello. I can see and hear proceedings, even if I can't turn off my mute button. Mrs. Posnett, I can see myself. Mrs. Yes, Radford. <laughs> I can see and hear everybody. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. Here. Uh, Mrs. Richards. Here, yeah, Lauren. Thank you. Mr. Richardson. So there Present. Backdrop you've got. I know, it's okay. Did you say Mrs. Richardson? I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Rushton. Here. Um, Mrs. Seaton. I'm present. Thank you. Mr. Sheehan. Present. Thank you. Mr. Shepherd. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Mrs. Taylor. Present. Mr. Welsh. Present. Mrs. A. Wright. Mrs. A. Wright. Hello, present. Thank you. Mrs. M. Wright. Hello, present. Mr. Wyatt. Mr. Wyatt. Yes, I'm present. I'll just go back Mr. to Mr. Gamble. The... I'm present. Thank you, Mr. Gamble. Um, so, Mr. O'Shea. Lauren, Mr. O'Shea isn't able to attend this afternoon, I'm afraid. OK. Um, Mr. Osborne. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, thank you, Lauren. <coughs> um, so um, we will now move on to protocol which you've all got and I trust that you have all read it so that you know how the meeting is going to proceed. I'll now go on to Chairman's announcements. Fabulous that I report the deaths of former county councillors, Councillor Jim Weir on the 11th of September 2020 and Mr Ray Mason on the 21st of September 2020. Colonel Weir served on the county council between 1985 and 1993 and represented the Oakham Electoral Division. He served on the Policy and Resources Committee, the Police Committee and the Public Protection Committee. He was also appointed a Deputy Lieutenant of Leicestershire in 1984 and transferred to the Rutland Lieutenancy in 1997 following the reorganisation of local government 
where he served as their Vice Lord Lieutenant until his retirement in 2006. Lieutenant was elected to the County Council in 1989 and served until 2005, representing the Sileby Electoral Division. He served on the County Council Cabinet until 2002 and then served on various bodies, including the Education Scrutiny Committee, the Development Control and Regulatory Board and the Combined Fire Authority. I call on members to stand in silent tribute to the memory of Councillor Jim Weir and Mr Ray Mason. Thank you. County Service, I wish to advise members that it is not possible to hold my planned county service at Leicester Cathedral on Sunday the 4th of October as planned. However, I am pleased to report that together with colleagues at the Cathedral, we have pre-recorded the service, which will be available to view on the Cathedral's website on the 4th of October at 3pm. In due course, my team will circulate details of how you will be able to access, access the service if you so wish. Agenda item number two minutes. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 8th of July 2020, copies of which have been circulated to members be taken as read, confirmed and signed. Hoffman will second. I have pleasure in seconding those minutes, uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr Kaufman. Is that agreed by everybody? Yes. Agreed. No agreed. So, agreed. Thank you. Agenda item number three, declarations of interest. I invite members who wish to do so to make declarations of interest in respect of items on the agenda for this meeting. I am assuming that all members who are also members of district councils will wish to declare a personal interest on the item in the leader's position statement on devolution. The following members wish to declare a personal interest in the position statement by the lead member for community organisations they are associated with received grants from the Community Fund. Dr Einan, as an active volunteer with Hermitage FM Carillion Wellbeing Radio, and Mr Mir as a trustee of the Bangladesh Social Association. Are there any other declarations? Mr. Uh, Madam Chairman, I got my hand raised. Same here. Hey, Mr Dawson. Yeah, um, I declare a personal interest in agenda item eight, the motion as a member of the National Farmers Union and also a customer client of NFU Mutual. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Austin. That's noted. Anybody else got any Chair, interest? Um, I'd like to declare an, an, uh, an interest, prejudicial interest in item seven. There's uh, two of the people who are independent persons are known to me one very well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Madam Chair. Pardon? No, Billy Moore. Sorry. Oh, Mr. Billy Moore. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just a um, personal interest uh, declaration in any matters. I'm just trying to get the very relevant bit. 
Um, so we're going to be talking primarily around agenda item six A, um, but primarily anything to do with SEND, as uh, my wife works within that arena on behalf of County Council. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fillimore. No other declarations. Oh, Mr. Parton. Do, Madam Chair, do we, uh, with regards to item eight, as members of the fire authority, uh, have to declare an interest because um, the uh, item eight does speak about the um, the fire service. If that's the case, I'm a member of the fire authority. Thank you, Mr. Parton, for that. Right, thank you very much indeed. We now can, can I say I there are a number of us are members of the fire authority, so do we take it as read? Yes, they will be recorded. Thank you very much. Agenda item number four, questions asked understanding orders. The question and replies set out in the order paper will be taken as read and entered into the minutes. We have had a supplementary question to question A submitted by Mr Hunt and a reply from Mr Pendleton. Question B, submitted by Mr Hunt and a reply from Mr Pendleton. Question E, submitted, submitted by Dr Einan and a reply from Mr Rushton. These are set out on the order paper. Can I take these as read? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. There are no dissensions, so we'll take that as read. Item number five, to receive, receive position statements from members of the Cabinet. A position statement may be given rise to an informal discussion by the Council. At the conclusion of the discussion, a formal motion may be moved to the effect that a particular issue relevant to the statement be referred to the Cabinet, the Commission, a Board or a Committee for consideration. This shall be moved and seconded formally and put without discussion. No other motion or amendment may be moved. The discussion of any position statement shall not exceed 20 minutes, but the chairman may permit an extension to this period. I now call on the leader to make his statement. Please use the raised hand function if you wish to speak. I will then invite the leaders of the opposition parties, Mr Golden and Dr Einan, to speak before inviting other members. Uh, leader, Mr Rushton. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairman, and thank you very much. My position statement has been published. The opposition leaders had it earlier on, and hopefully all members have got it before them. Um, on the uh, devolution um, a bit of the statement, I don't propose to add uh, anything to it. Suffice to say that a meeting has been arranged for the uh, three county leaders uh, mid-October-ish, and uh, we'll be at attending that. Uh, on the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, Madam Chairman, this is exceedingly uh, serious and I do intend to read it into the record verbatim. So uh, next month, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse will hold its hearing into organisations responses to allegations relating to children, including those who were in the County Council's care against former Leicestershire Member of Parliament, Greville Janner. It is timely and important that we acknowledge the experience of those who have suffered abuse and that we recognise the courage it takes to step forward and recount historic events. It is also important that their voices are heard. From the outset, we pledged our full support to the inquiry and since 2016, we've provided wide, wide ranging information to ensure that we have met the inquiry's expectations at every stage of the process. We know that children and young people rely on us to keep them safe, and this is a priority for us. We know that there have been failures in the past, and where the County Council should have taken more action more quickly to prevent abuse. I am sorry that this, this did not always happen. Children safeguarding locally and nationally has been completely transformed since the period in question, but we remain committed to learning and to improving services to ensure that our children are safe. That concludes my statement, Madam Chairman. Very much, uh, Mr Rushton. Uh, 
Dr. Gal Mr. Galton, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and good, good afternoon. Um, and thank the leader for his statement. So just briefly on the second part, uh, obviously agree 100% what the leader said and um, absolutely back uh, the view that he's expressed this afternoon uh, about being sorry for what has happened in the past. I think in general terms, it's best if um, this inquiry takes place uh, and we see the outcome of that. And then I'm sure uh, as a council, as members, we will want to reflect on that very carefully, learn any lessons, as the leader's statement says, and uh, undertake, if necessary, any scrutiny of any recommendations that come out of it. But as I say, I think it's best that that is allowed to take its course. So I wanted to focus on the other aspect of the leader's statement um, was in relation to the devolution and local government reorganisation. And I had made some notes. I made them a few weeks ago, uh, Chairman, when um, the leader came to scrutiny. And um, I, 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 I'm going to say them anyway, but they're, of course they're out of date now and uh, they're probably no longer relevant. But I, I think that local people will be amazed that the government were choosing at this moment to force a top down reorganisation of social care schools, councils, when instead we need to be focusing 100 percent on helping communities recover from the virus, from the coronavirus crisis. And I think there's a danger that it had that been pressed forward, um, people could have been accused, politicians could have been accused as being out of touch and embarking on a wasteful distraction when there are so many more important things to do to get our communities back on their feet. Um, but of course it was interesting that the government's intention didn't last long. Mr Clark at the time the minister's speech mysteriously vanished from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government's website not long after he'd um, announced this, um, this, this proposal as did Mr. Clark, Madam Chairman. He also disappeared and we now have a new local government uh, minister. Um, and, now, and now, of course, it's like the whole thing didn't really happen. Uh, had the minister misspoken, perhaps? I, I know it was stated that he went off to spend more time with his family, uh, but did we imagine what has said? Or perhaps even Mr. Cummings hadn't seen the speech or signed it off. So we are where we are. But the general impression that I've got from leaders across the East Midlands is there's not so much enthusiasm for what our leader here has been saying. And I'd just like to, in summary, say what I think where, where we are with this proposal. Um, the first is that the change of minister has resulted in a change of direction. That's number one. Two, the devolution bill is being delayed and probably is going to be downplayed. Three, the tie up between the East Midlands, Leicestershire, Notts and Derbyshire may well not happen now. Four, change will only take place where it's not contentious. I think that's a significant change from what was said a few weeks ago. And three, I think there's a great, uh, uh, won't happen, uh, unitary counties will be allowed to, to go ahead across the, the East Midlands. So, so the danger is that we, uh, you know, we as a council become obsessed. Of opposition, I think things have changed radically, as I say, in the last few weeks, not ensure entirely sure what that change, why it was brought about. Was it solely the departure of one minister? I know the leader has still undertaken to guarantee a vote in this council chamber before we get to that. But I, but, but my feeling at the moment is that this is unlikely to surface until the spring again, or maybe even after the local elections. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goldton. Um, Dr. Einan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and I thank the leader for his um, statement. And uh, along with uh, Simon Galton, we are very pleased to see his comments um, regarding the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. Uh, clearly, um, we are uh, 
sorry as a council for any uh, harm that has happened to anyone in our care. And uh, we look forward to the results of the inquiry and to learning any necessary lessons from that. As regards um, the other part of his statement regarding devolution, uh, yes, um, I too made a statement uh, to, on behalf of the Labour Group to the Cabinet on the 18th of September. And at that time, we, uh, though we have in some in principle sympathy with uh, the idea of a unitary council, we were disappointed that, that at that time um, the government seemed to be more interested in reorganising councils than remunerating them properly. Um, it seems that some of the ideas that I put forward there may have been taken on um, at Westminster. You know, they seem to be expecting us to respond to the risks of leaving Europe with no deal and the chaos around East Midlands Airport and a total rewrite of the planning system, which I gather upsets um, his uh, the Conservatives almost as much as it does us. Um, and uh, and then you know the idea that this is this is not not contentious. It is thoroughly contentious. The idea of unification in both Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, um, and uh, there is probably more um, contention within the Conservative Party over this issue uh, locally than there is amongst the Labour group. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, as Simon Galton pointed out, this whole thing ends up on the back burner, which would be disappointing in many ways, because it wouldn't resolve some of the issues that we do need to tackle. That at the Golden Triangle around the airport and the Ratcliffe Power Station, we have areas of mutual responsibility that we do need to understand how they are going to be managed by um, the three cities and the three counties. Um, we do need a proper solution to that that will not lead to further centralisation. And that is the concern that the Labour group will have throughout this, this uh, debate, which will no doubt rumble on for many years, um, is that if unitary status or devolution is in fact more centralisation, then it will be difficult to gain support from uh, Labour members on that issue. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Einan. Uh, Mr. Mullaney has raised his hand to, to speak, so over to Mr. Mullaney now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the issue of the unitaries, I'm sorry to see that the leader of the county council is still pursuing his plans to abolish Hinckley and Bosworth and the other boroughs and districts and create one unitary authority for the whole of Leicestershire. It's particularly bad timing, given the fact we are still trying to get through the COVID situation to unleash such a disruptive, uh, time consuming alteration to local government at this time is not really the right time to do it. And it really should be dropped. Furthermore, a unitary authority would undermine local decision making without necessarily improving financial situation. As Professor Alistair Jones, the Professor of Politics at De Montfort University in Leicester, said recently, the move to unitary authority is a huge mistake. The alleged e economies of scale are contestable. Academic literature is split 50-50 on the subject. On harm to democracy, there is near unanimity. There will be less public engagement and authorities will be more distant. But even if we accept his argument that there will be a financial benefit to moving to unitaries, his, his plans have already shown that people in Hinckley and Bosworth won't benefit because the plan is to reduce council tax to the level of the lowest local authority. And because Lib Dem run Hinckley and Bosworth has the lowest local lowest council tax, our residents wouldn't actually receive a, a council tax cut, yet we would still lose the local accountability and local representation from losing our borough council. So the people in Hinckley wouldn't benefit. Also, the local government minister, the previous one, stated that unitary authorities should be between 300 and 600,000 people. Leicestershire 700,000. And the only exceptions would be if there was one a, a local community that had a distinct identity, such as a city. Well, given that Leicestershire is 800 square miles of sprawling towns and villages, there clearly isn't one united identity for Leicestershire. And therefore, it's not suitable for one unitary authority. Also, there isn't general agreement to the proposals. Uh, not only do the Lib Dems oppose it, but also many Conservative councillors, including Hinckley and Bosworth, have spoken against the plans. The Labour head of the LGA has said it's the wrong time to unleash unitaries at the moment during COVID. And there are Labour councillors in Hinckley and Bosworth who have opposed it 
as well. Two years ago, Councillor Rushton in his leader's statement welcomed uh, a meeting with the then junior local government minister who was sympathetic to his case for fair funding for Leicestershire. And he said this person had a bright future and was going to be really successful. Uh, this individual is now Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he is in charge of the nation's finances. Surely, rather than unleashing this disruptive unitary plan, the council and the MPs should be lobbying Rishi Sunak to give Leicestershire the fair funding that we need so that residents can have the services that we need. Please drop the unitary plans and instead carry on with fighting for fair funding for Leicestershire. Thank you. Lady. No one else has indicated they wish to speak. So, Mr. Rushton, do you wish to reply? Yes, for, for Chairman, can I formally thank the uh, opposition leaders, Simon and Terry, for supporting the Leicestershire County Council apology. I think it'll show us in a very, very good light that we're all sincere and united in that apology. Uh, on local government devolution, I, I'm not going to go on at length about it today. Suffice to say that we did what we were asked to do uh, by Robert Jenrick at the time. Uh, I have now got a meeting with the new minister, because the old one, as has been pointed out, has gone. Simon, Simon is right, it, and Terry is right, it, it may be delayed. In fact, it probably it already is delayed, because we were promised the white paper in September, then we've said we'll get it in October, and if you believe the runes which are lying around, it could be next year or it could be after May. But as far as I'm concerned, we did what we were asked to do. I've joined up with the leaders of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire to put forward a six C's model, which delivers on a government priority, as I was told, which is a regionally elected, directly elected mayor to enable the East Midlands to counterbalance what um, Andy Street does in the West Midlands. And whether you like him or not, he certainly has been a good advocate for the West Midlands because you only have to look at the amount of money the West Midlands has has managed to get compared to us. So I don't want to go on about it. I know that it's a divisive issue. It's it's a divisive issue uh, to a certain extent in my group. Uh, it's a, well, I think the Liberals are totally opposed to it. Uh, and I know it's slightly divisive in Terry's group. So let's leave it where we are. I have promised the full council a vote if we ever get to have to bid for something. And um, I, sh I, shall sh I shall say no more. Apart from a quick prod of Michael Mullaney, as usual, well, Michael comes here and he sounds just like a Hinckley and Bosworth borough councillor. It would be far better if he came here and spoke as a district councillor and the benefits that Leicestershire, being a county councillor, brings to Hinckley and Bosworth, rather than constantly going on about being a a district councillor. I know he has aspirations to uh, get beyond being just a district councillor. He has tried many times to become a member of parliament in Hinckley Bosworth and has failed on multiple occasions. And I just ask him in the future, when he comes here as a county councillor, please, please be a county councillor because that is what people elected you here to be. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Rushton, I've just been told that Mr. Bill has indicated that his wishes to speak. Uh, and being as this is an informal uh, statement, uh, I can ask Mr. Bill now to speak. Yes, well, <laughs> yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I, I do agree with um, uh, with, with what Simon, um, si Simon Terry and indeed Michael. M M I think Michael speaks with passion and I don't think that, um, I don't think it's really right that um, People should be should, should be criticised for speaking as they feel. What 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 has surprised me about this leader statement is the absence of other issues which we are which we know are about to overwhelm us. I don't know where it's come to the leader's attention, but we we face a crisis not just of COVID which we all are working together with, and we know, but, but we, we face a, a, a crisis of the economy, which is an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable state of affairs, which we've never had to face before. We are going to see thousands of our people thrown out of work because of the end, ending of furlough, and further thousands probably affected because we are simply just making a complete pig's ear 
of all the negotiations with our European trading partners. It's, it, I'm sorry, it's, it, it's all going pear-shaped and all we can talk about, apart from the, the sexual abuse issue, all we seem to be able to talk about this afternoon is a theoretical unitary status uh, tilting at windmills, uh, uh, something that's never going to happen because there isn't a single district council in the East Midlands that signed up to it. It cannot happen because there's no unanimity on it. But why aren't we discussing the real crises that are affecting every single one of us and every single one of the people you represent? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just astonished at the way this meeting has started. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Uh, Mr. Rushton. Chairman, can I yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Can I speak to Mr. Astonished from Hinckley and say to him that uh, my uh, statement is short. Uh, the serious bit is obviously the fulsome apology on the child sexual abuse and, and something which we should be proud of. But if you wait a little while, Mr. Astonished, you'll notice that there are two other position statements coming, one from uh, Lee Brecken and one from Louise Richardson, followed again then by a long speech from... Uh, Mr. Rhodes, which sets out the financial predicament. So if Mr. Astonished will wait 15 minutes, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Thank you very much, Mr. Rushton. Um, we're now going to ask the lead member for health uh, to make his statement. Please use the raised hand function if you wish to speak. The following members have asked to speak on this item, Dr. Hill and Ms. Ack. I will ask them to speak before inviting other members. So over to the lead member, uh, Mr Brecken. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to start by noting that the last time the Council met was on the 8th of July, 10 days after the first local lockdown was announced in England, which covered parts of Leicester City and parts of Leicestershire. It does seem like a long time ago. Last week saw it being six months since lockdown measures were first announced. In that time, Leicestershire has seen over 134,000 tests completed, with over 4,300 tests being positive and Leicestershire having recorded 540 deaths. In what has been a difficult and pressured time, I do not want to overlook the success the Council had in leading efforts to reduce the rate of infection in the county from twice the national average to below the national average. In Melton, we showed what can be done when we launched a campaign designed to reduce rates following the rising cases there through testing, good local communications, engagement with the population and enforcement activity when needed. It did prove very effective. But since the start of September, as Director of Public Health, Mike Sands, has said in his briefings to members that the local and national picture has deteriorated markedly with a rapid rise in cases. At the time of writing this report, Opie and Wigston continues to have the highest rate in the county at 91.1 per 100,000 population, followed by Blaby on 48.8, Charwood on 48.7 and Harborough on 41.1. Compared to yesterday, all areas in the county except Blaby and Harborough have stabilised or have increased their own rates. The rate in Leicestershire has increased to 44.4 per 100,000 population, but has remained below the national average, which is currently 58.5 per 100,000 population. The national rate has continued to increase daily over the past nine days, which has now climbed from 33.2 per 100,000 to its current 58.5 per 100,000. These were the figures as at 9am today, and they will soon be out of date. That is how quickly we are, we are moving. We know what we have to do. We know we are asking a lot to continue to ask our residents, many of whom do abide by the rules, to continue to do so for some more time to come but the virus is not going away and we cannot drop our guard. With the current testing program under strain, now more than ever, we need to recognise that this is something that affects the whole of our county. Whatever people may think of the government, the guidance and the statutory regulations, it is up to the people of Leicestershire to do the right thing and get this done. As Mike has said throughout his numerous TV and radio appearances and media releases, for which we are all very thankful for the way he has represented our council, we are doing everything we can to stem the rise. We are urging residents to play their part. By doing so, you are protecting yourselves, your loved ones and your livelihoods. By reinforcing the following messages, we can all play our part. 
If you have a high temperature, a continuous new cough or loss of taste or smell, please book a test. Wash your hands regularly. Keep two metres apart and away from others. Wear a face covering as per guidelines, including public transport, unless you have a good reason. Do not meet up with family or friends you don't live with inside or outside. And if you're contacted by test and trace, you must isolate for 14 days. On top of all the COVID-19 work, the public health team have continued to offer support in all of their defined work areas, including mental health, weight management, warm homes, winter flu, domestic violence, supporting the Opie and Wigson Health Inequality Work, Wellfest, as well as the key link work with adult social care and children and families services. I would also say thank you for the work the team did during World Suicide Prevention Week under the Start a Conversation banner. The work of this council has continued even with all this, all that this pandemic has thrown at us. And it is a tribute to Mike Sands and his team in guiding us all safely through it this far. The management team for public health consisting of Adrian, Kath, Fiona, Liz, Joshna, Claire and Kelly, who have delivered all of this, should be thanked. The public health administration team of Beth, Manveer and Lewis have dealt with directing so many queries and also freedom of information requests. I would like to give a special mention for Natalie, who has delivered our data reports, and also to Natasha for running our local contact tracing service. I have named a few, but you are all thanked here. Finally, a mention for the media team, including Joe and Katie, who have been invaluable in making sure that we get key messages out in time and on time. Mike, you should be very proud, as we are, of your whole team. I know we are not out of the wood yet, some may call it a forest, but we all need to remain focused on following the expert advice that we get based on the evidence. Together we can support all of our residents in getting them the support they may need, and once again enjoy the health and well-being that we all have come to expect and deserve. Remember, we really do all own this and have our part to play. As the Prime Minister said in his latest address to the nation, we must rely on our willingness to look out for each other and to protect each other. Never in our history has our collective destiny and our collective health depended so completely on our individual behaviour. If we follow these simple rules together, we will get through this winter together. There are unquestionably difficult months to come and the fight against COVID is by no means over. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Brecken, uh, I'll now call on Dr. Hill. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Lee. I think we should all thank the Director of Public Health, Mike Sanders, and his staff for the amazing amount of work they've put in the last few months. Uh, it's been remarkable, and it's, I mean, we've, <laughs> the whole all council staff, I suspect, have had a difficult time of it, but they've been at the sort of forefront of it all. And I guess there's a risk of COVID fatigue, certainly in the wider public, of, of continuing to see it through. But I think one thing that, um, and it, it, we've got to accept it's a long job. It's what we can't instantly say, here we go, it's going to be fixed, you know, five weeks of lockdown and we can all go home and it's going to be the same. And I think a lot of people have had trouble adjusting to that. And what is particularly galling are those who studiously refuse to actually do their bit and follow the rules, which actually puts everybody at risk. And the lack of desire on some people's part, certainly on social media, to understand that individual action can actually make a difference on a wider level to other people they've never met. I'm also pleased now the County Council is fully involved at public health level compared to where we were some sort of July, August, when central government were treating us like a load of naughty children and weren't actually engaging us and allowing local guys to do their job, which they do very well. And I think uh, Lee alluded to the point of we may have different views on what the government uh, successes with this have been. I mean, currently, I think there's a number of things going on nationally that were foreseeable that uh, perhaps the government chose not to see for whatever reason. Um, there seems to be a desire for people to be able to get coffee in the centre of London and fill offices up rather than actually protect people. But that's a difference of opinion, I guess. And, I, and one area around that is the surprise at the need for testing at this point in time. That, that said, it doesn't absolve any of us from doing the right thing and being leaders and in our communities and being seen to do the right thing. As Mike's alluded to, sorry, as Lee's alluded to, it's important that we follow the rules and do what we can to make this I won't say go away, but keep it under control so we can all live more, live more normal lives. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hill. <clears throat> Ms. Hack? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I'd like to uh, uh, concur with with my other colleagues with regards to thanking for Mike and the team for the work that's been done all the way through COVID-19 and, and obviously before then. I think just in just in a, a, a reference to the previous item, um, if now isn't the time to talk about unitary status, it certainly isn't the time to talk about reorganising public health. And that is something that we need to be keeping an eye on. Um, I think it's important from a health, you know, a, a position statement on health is that we did focus um, on COVID. It's been, it's it's clearly the the issue of the moment um, and certainly an issue of, of our lifetimes. So important to focus on that. Um, I think, well, so obviously welcome the update from Lee in terms of the infection rates across the whole of the district areas. I think our interaction with our city colleagues and also the um, those areas outside of Leicestershire on our boundaries are also as important. And and uh, maybe some 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 um, comment come back from the lead member on our interaction with those colleagues would be helpful. I think the, as I say, COVID is the is the issue at the moment. I think we have to ensure that we don't take our eye off all the health protection activities, and certainly in joint health scrutiny, we've been having a look at those things as well. Um, just in reference this morning, reported on BBC Breakfast, we're about a million um, appointments down in terms of the breast screening cancer program um, and I think that's something that we just need to be keeping an eye that that we're not actually um, forgetting our prevention services um, throughout this this process and we have to catch up um, we obviously with within our um, health scrutiny we've also looked at dentistry and other key services that are, are, are actually losing ground over this time and we need to be putting in strategies in place to to, to catch up I think it would also be useful just to note at this point that the consultation on the £450 million spend of reorganising Leicestershire hospitals has been released us this week. Um, and I think from a health, you know, from a health position point of view, really important to get those messages over to the public um, that they have the opportunity to um, to put forward their their concerns, their comments, their what they would would like to see um, in the massive reorganisation of NHS services across our city and county. Um, and finally, just like to obviously just uh, just to agree with my colleagues in terms of making sure that we all play our part um, and try and do the right things, try and get the messages out to our um, local communities about keeping on track with washing our hands, keeping our distance from other people um, and wearing a face covering. Um, I genuinely believe those are simple messages that really could pay dividend. But thank you for the lead member of this statement. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hatt. Um, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the opportunity to say a few words, but I, I thought it was appropriate as representing an area that's probably suffered the most in Leicestershire from COVID. Uh, Obin Wigston and particularly Obin, my, my, my division, really has suffered. Uh, and I really want to take the opportunity of thanking our um, department in County Hall for the work that they've done in cooperation with, without upsetting the leader, I can say the borough council, they have really worked together um, in order. Uh, we've had to have a couple of enforcements and close a couple of restaurants, and they really work together as as one in order to protect the people of Obi and Wigston. The majority of people in Obi are are sticking by the rules and doing all they can. But there is a substantial minority, it is a minority, who absolutely refuse to do whatever is right and protect themselves and other people. So I welcome any enforcement in order to protect the, the majority of sensible people, particularly the elderly, which I suppose I'm getting that age now. Uh, but and I suppose I ought to declare an interest. But our department at County Hall has done a good job and more power to their elbow. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Kaufman. Uh, Dr. Feltham. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mrs. Hacker has stolen one of the things I was going to say <laughs> about the 450 million consultation. Very important. People study it uh, and to let people know uh, that, particularly, obviously, those who are watching uh, this later, um, the joint health scrutiny 
meeting, which is a meeting of members of Leicestershire, Leicester City and Rutland. Um, we're having a discussion of it and therefore uh, responding to the consultation on October the 15th. So look in your diaries and uh, watch out for that information. Um, clearly, uh, I, people from time to time actually do ask me, inquire, I suppose just because they're, um, as, if they're where it is people, what my doctorate's in. It's actually in microbiology. Um, for the last 50 years, I have practiced microbiology. I would notice the word practice. It's a funny word to use, but I've never really got the hang of it. Hang of it. Um, at least 15 of those years, I actually spent as an epidemiologist working with a consultant in, in communicable disease, um, sort of one stage down from a director of public health, actually on TB in London boroughs. Uh, and together we wrote a report for the then uh, a Department of Health, actually, um, about TB and the problems that were had in the 1990s. Um, it's very different from COVID, of course, but bear in mind today in the world, between one and a half and 1.75 million people are still dying of TB every year. Um, it's a major disease, but there are medicines, there are treatments, there are ways of coping with it. Sadly, many of the deaths are in, obviously in the third world, which is a great shame, um, but we still have deaths um, in cities of this world. New York has now managed to overcome some of the problems it has, um, but they were one of the major cities uh, in the Western world having TB. This COVID thing is very different. Um, TB, as a microbiologist, I can tell you, you can actually look down the microscope and see it. Um, you can't see COVID down the microscope. Um, it's an invisible uh, back, it's an invisible virus, virus, of course, um, which we still haven't got a proper treatment for. Um, I have volunteered to be a, um, an Oxford vaccine trialist, um, and uh, I've now had my initial jab, and now I've had my booster, and I'm having to swab myself every week to send it off to see whether I've managed to catch COVID in the meantime. Uh, so far, I'm lucky. Um, but it just shows, I think, that you know, across the country, across the world, how many people are working on this, and how many people are working to put it right. And here locally, we have Mike Sands and his fantastic team um, who have done absolute wonders. Um, really is. Um, I have occasionally, I have private chats with them. Um, not really microbiologist to microbiologist, but more uh, council member to um, to director of public health. Uh, but it really does it show, I think, that you know, we really have come on top of it. So much so, and I, and I urge people, um, when Mike gives his briefings that we get as members, uh, usually on Tuesday afternoon, uh, a whole load of charts come up. And one of the charts um, I'm particularly interested in is the one that's about the middle layer super output areas, the MSOAs, because I like to check, as I hope all of you are, in what's happening in your areas. And dreaded this week, because yesterday, there was my own particular patch um, rising up the table. And they've had 10 new cases announced in the last two weeks in just one small area south of Odeby. Uh, that's comparing that with five over the previous five months. It takes make you worry, doesn't it? I've been putting messages out all, all, all yesterday and today, um, warning people. And it's back to that same message which everyone else has been saying, and I totally comply with it. And that is we need to look, wash our hands, cover our face, and ensure we keep space with other people when it's possible. Um, it's so important. Um, but really, we have got a superb team. And I just another, another way of saying thank you to Mike Hudson's and his team. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Felton. And Mr. Parton. Didn't do that. Picking up on the issue of something that was in the newspapers today regarding the, the, the backlog of tests for cancer screening, it's worth looking at the minutes of the of both the Health Scrutiny Committee we had at County Hall last week and also uh, we also had on um, Friday, we had the Joint Health Scrutiny with Leicester City Council. One of the items was the letter from the Chief Executive of NHS England and the Chief, Chief Operating Officer. And what they did was they set out for an NHS priorities from August. And it's interesting to read what they've put. They've put that having pulled out all the stops to treat COVID patients, our health services now need to redouble their focus on the needs of all other patients too. 
Now, they split their priorities, their recovery plan into three. And it's very interesting that A, out of the A, B and C, A is accelerating the return of non-COVID health services, making full use of the capacity available in the window of opportunity between now and winter. And A1 is restore full operation of all cancer services. And we did hear from the chief nurse at Leicester Hospitals that we are almost on target to meet all referrals for cancer in Leicestershire. So there is a good news story there. And also in that paper, there's the talk of mental health services. And they also have worked extremely hard to, to maintain the already busy service for mental health, but also with the expected uplift and this single access point, this one telephone number, was a very astute response, really, at the beginning of the pandemic to be able to get people triage quicker. So there is good news in Leicestershire Partnerships Trust that we are dealing with the cancer situation. I'm not using the word backlog, but certainly anybody that needed cancer treatment and scans has either had it or is in the process of receiving that treatment. And also that mental health is being very carefully marshaled um, out of single access point and the team at Glenfield. Thank you, Mr. Parton. Uh, Mrs. Newton. You're on mute, Betty. To say that I declared an interest in what Ted had to say because I have a son and daughter who both work in mental health and adult nursing. My real question is just a very short question, but it really has to do with social interaction and loneliness for people who are living on their own. There's a lot of vulnerable people out there who are frightened to go out. There's really a fear of going out there. And we mustn't lose sight that we're doing a lot, but I think we may even need to look a little bit further at what we can do because of the fear of interaction of these vulnerable people. So we may be perhaps to see what more we can do to help people who are frightened to leave their homes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rushton. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, can I first of all thank uh, the, the Deputy Chairman, uh, a certain Geoffrey Kaufman, for the praises heaped on the County Council as a very assiduous uh, County Councillor for the Odeby Wigston area. Thank you, Geoffrey. Uh, can I, first of all, as well, uh, we've all thanked uh, Mike Sands, and rightly so, and Mike and his team. Uh, it's also worth saying that Mike's actually a very, very nice person, and one of the reasons people uh, get on with him is be because of that. He also works exceedingly well with Ivan in the city. So, you know, we've not only got a good a good man there with a good team, we've actually got a nice person who, who works with people, and I think... People have appreciated his style uh, and uh, the way he talks when we have the all-member briefing. So can you pass that back on to uh, Mike, please, Lee? And also, Lee, can I formally uh, thank you as leader for the work you've done throughout uh, this pandemic uh, on, on the COVID-19 stuff, but also your regular day job. And as you know, one thing I'm particularly proud of here is our, our work on suicide prevention. So I, I thank you for that as well. And with that, I've finished, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brecken, would you like to? Yeah, please, if, if I may. I mean, certainly thanks to all members. I mean, Dr. Hill, um, I think it is a long haul. I think we're all aware of that now. I think we hoped we could beat it and come out of it, but um, I think it is going to be a long haul. Certainly, that's the view of our Director of Public Health as well. So th thank you for your comments. Um, Mrs. Hack, I mean, certainly, I mean, Mike, with his city colleagues, I think really Ivan Brown is opposite in the city. Um, they have, uh, Mike and him, have become the faces of our local authorities in Leicester and Leicestershire. 
And I think certainly the the weekly and daily briefings and meetings that Mike and his team have with Ivan's team um, really do mean that we are working closely uh, to make sure that we, we do cover Leicester, Leicestershire and also Rutland as well, that obviously play a, a, a part. So, um, and I, I think the um, the Health and Wellbeing Board has dealt with the uh, awareness and updates regarding the slippage in uh, what we've seen on normal day-to-day -day NHS business. And I think they're very keen, both the uh, Clinical Commissioning Group, the University Hospital Trust, and also the Leicestershire Partnership Trust. Uh, they are very keen that um, they do want to get back. They do want to get back to, to their normal day job as well. And certainly local plans are in place. And I'm sure through the, uh, the scrutiny, I think the joint scrutiny and also the Health and Wellbeing Board, we can make sure that we monitor that and, and see that coming to back into play. And I, I think that is very important. Um, Mr. Kaufman, certainly thank you for your comments and thank you for the praise. I, I, I think that's, that, that, that is appreciated. I think the work that's been done um, in Obi and Wigson, and I think what the residents in Obi and Wigson have had to go through and have achieved to date, um, let's hope that continues and everyone plays their part. Uh, Dr. Felton, thank you. Uh, well done for the trial. Um, I know there were requests for volunteers and good luck with that. Please do stay safe. Um, and I, I think I'd, I'd probably just finish um, with one of sort of Mike's uh, current sayings, Mike has many sayings. I, I think we all like him for that. I think I think the leaders said, and certainly thanks to the leader for his kind comments as well. Uh, the, um, Mike is is a very uh, nice person to talk to, and he comes out with realistic terms, and he tries to give us uh, scenarios and analogies that sort of uh, work. And so I won't use his box and Maltesers one that he's using of late, but I think Mike clearly says that the route out of this is for all of us to change our behaviour. And I think we can all do the right thing. And I think he, he does believe that we're all capable of doing that, no matter who we are and where we are within Leicester, Shire, Leicester, Leicester and Rutland. And we can do that. So um, I think with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bracken. Uh, I now call on the lead member for communities, Mrs. Richardson, to make her statement. Please use the raised hand function again if you wish to speak. The following member has asked to speak on this item, Mr. Demir, and I will ask him to speak before inviting other members. Mrs. Richardson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm delighted to take this opportunity today to provide an overview of the work the Council has carried out to support Leicestershire communities over the past financial year. The County Council has once again played an active part in supporting and strengthening the communities of Leicestershire. Together we've achieved a great deal and often some of it in very challenging circumstances. The prime focus of my portfolio is to create thriving Leicestershire communities where people of all ages, backgrounds and abilities participate and help each other. This vision provides a foundation for how we want to work with communities now and in the future. We have a lot to be proud of in Leicestershire and the annual report, there is a link in this statement to it, highlights how the council and community groups are working hard to utilise the commitment, the talent and the skills of people in our communities to achieve change for the better. At the very end of the period covered by the annual report, we were faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst this has presented us with numerous challenges, I can proudly say the response in Leicestershire has been absolutely incredible and has demonstrated the resilience of our communities in tackling one of the most difficult periods in our history. I'm truly heartened by the willingness of people to volunteer to help others and provide support for their neighbours, particularly those who are vulnerable. I would like to thank all the officers from Tom, Zaffa and the rest of the team who have been working so hard to ensure day-to-day -day tasks are carried out alongside COVID, exit from EU and flooding resilience. I would urge all members in your capacity as community leaders and champions to look at the initiatives and projects highlighted in the annual report. I'm sure they'll provide inspiration for our continuing efforts to build and sustain communities in Leicestershire that are strong, resilient, happy and healthy. And please note the community website 
it offers a lot of information for members and for the public. I've got brief highlights of some of the schemes and activities carried out below this statement, but I particularly want to draw your attention to our work with our forces, resulting in the gold award for our work with the armed forces community across Leicestershire. The Communities Fund, where the uh, council has allocated £1.5 million to give assistance to organisations suffering hardship due to COVID. Also, the green plaques, where we are now going to be resuming our work in the communities, with our next unveiling hopefully in November, obviously observing, observing any COVID restrictions at the time. Thank you. Mr Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to echo uh, some of what uh, Mrs Richardson has said. Um, and I think um, it, we've had a tough time um, out in the community, um, especially the community groups. Um, and at a time when, if you go back to March and April, it was very bleak, uh, the beginning of lockdown. And I think the County Council reacted very fast, um, uh, very quickly uh, to help the, the voluntary sector. Um, I think the national focus was on, on everybody else, uh, but the County Council, and I think uh, it was Nick, uh, Terry and Simon got together um, and this fund was devised. Um, and you can see the numbers of, of groups that have been helped. Um, and in fact, it was so overwhelming that it was increased by half a million pounds. Um, and I honestly think that some organisations that would have folded um, actually uh, didn't because of this fund, but other organisations were able to help the residents, uh, those most vulnerable that needed uh, through food packages, food parcels um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think this was, just shows the partnership working of the voluntary community, if we should support them, and as which we clearly did. Um, and I think it's important going forward as well, because um, as I've mentioned several times, um, COVID isn't going away, unfortunately. Um, and we think we need our voluntary sectors there helping our communities um, as best as they can. And I think this kind of support going forward, I know the Shire grants um, are there, maybe applications to them are paused at the moment, but if they can be reopened for the future, that would be great. Or other, other schemes going forward just to help, because I think helping them to engage in volunteers would ultimately um, free up resources within the county councils for us to concentrate on other bigger things um, as well. But thank you very much for that. And I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there are no more speakers, so we'll now move on to agenda item number six. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Richardson, I forgot to come back to you. I've got carried mm -hmm. away. Thank so, you. I'd just like to thank Mr. Mears for his uh, comments and to say that uh, because of this, this funding this year does not mean that the Shire grants will no, no longer carry on. We do intend to bring them back next year. Thank you. I know lots of people are very pleased about that, Mrs. Richardson, and thank you. Right, this is to agenda item number six, which are reports of the Cabinet. It's the medium term financial strategy latest position. Mr. Rhodes will move and Mr. Shepherd will second. Then following that, the following members have asked to speak, Mr. Galton and Dr. Einan. And again, if anyone else wishes to speak, please press the raise hand button. I am advised that several members. OK, that's it then. So we'll now move on to Mr Rhodes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in the nine months since I last reported on the state of the Council's finances, the world's been turned upside down. Established ways of working in offices have disappeared. Nearly 3,000 of our employees are working from home. Meetings are being conducted online using Teams or Zoom. Trading operations, including catering, are minimal, but social care for both adults and families, trading standards and highways maintenance have continued, even though the challenges are greater than before. Some services have experienced brief shutdowns and then restarted, albeit at a reduced level. Country parks have been busier than ever. The County Council has provided assistance to businesses, community organisations and individuals to help them get through the crisis. But all this has cost money. £90 million more than in the budget and still counting. 
The government have provided significant assistance, but we still have to find £20 million to balance the books this year. We will do this by £18 million revenue transfers from the capital programme, which has been reviewed and reduced, and measures to contain day-to-day -day expenditure, which should yield additional savings. This puts additional pressure on an already tightly prioritised capital programme, but provides the cash we need for the current year. So, so far, so good. However, next year, and in the two years following, the position worsens considerably. Next year, the gap is forecast to be 20 million, the year after 30 million, and the year after that, 50 million. These figures include shortfalls already forecast pre-COVID. The main problem will be falling income from council tax and to a lesser extent business rates as the economic effects of the pandemic emerge in the form of reduced business activity and unemployment. The government have indicated they will reimburse the council for some of the lost trading income and are considering developing a scheme to compensate for reduced tax income. It is far from clear how much relief these measures will bring. The County Council itself has few tools left to reduce expenditure. Yearly costs have already been reduced by 223 million as a result of cost reduction and transformation measures over the last nine years. More in relative terms than any other council when you consider our low funding starting point. Leicestershire is the most productive council in England. But that leaves little scope for more cost savings. Income from our investment fund, the Corporate Asset Investment Fund, created from money set aside to meet future liabilities, will increase from 4.5 million to 10 million per annum, and this will help to fill the gap. But the major changes we had hoped for from government to social care and, and, and SEND funding have not been delivered. And the most important change, fair funding, has been postponed yet again. Inevitably, therefore, we shall have to curtail some activities and consider reducing services. Some councils have indicated they will run out of money in the next few months. Section 114 notices are being drawn up in preparation. I can tell you that Leicestershire is not one of those councils. But we are and continue to be the lowest funded county council in the country, in spite of years of representation to the government. Councils in central London continue to receive grant aid equivalent to as much as £400 more core funding per head than Leicestershire. If we were funded as well as Islington, we'd have another £300 million to spend each year. We'd be partying every day, and of course at a social distance. But we don't get funded fairly, nor do we receive a fair share of other grants, such as for COVID. Leicestershire County Council and Leicestershire boroughs and district councils lose out every time. Yes, don't be surprised, Leicestershire districts lose out too. Over the years, their underfunding has been concealed by the 80-20 rule which has allocated 80% of new homes bonus and business rate increases to them. One or two with exceptional amounts of development have done very well out of it. But new homes bonus is being phased out and business rates allocation across the country is due to be reset. Some districts in Leicestershire are in for a tough time. We've lobbied our MPs for years about the unfairness of the local government funding system they write letters for us and take it up with ministers, but no action ensues. We need them to fight harder for Leicestershire. They know the damage underfunding does to services for their constituents. Only one minister has ever understood the position. That's Rishi Sunak. He was making progress until he was promoted to the top job. He has too much on his plate now to deal with this issue. The current ministers that housing communities and local government could sort this out this afternoon. All they have to do is to adopt the Leicestershire model, which is simple and fair and will be easy to implement. Or they could adopt the more complicated system, which their civil servants are cobbling together, 
that will be better than nothing. Before I conclude, Chairman, I need to explode a myth which is circulating and is being propagated in some district council circles. That is that the county council has hidden reserves, some say as much as 350 million, if only. The true figure of uncommitted reserves is the county fund, which currently stands at 19 million. This represents about two weeks spend. It is true that the council has cash and investments, but all these have to be set against liabilities including earmarked funds to support the recently reduced capital programme, provisions for future liabilities and historic debt, 263 million, which one day will have to be repaid. It is dangerous and inaccurate talk to claim that committed cash and assets can be used for new capital or revenue expenditure. That would be the route to section 114. It would also contravene local government financial rules using money set aside for MRP would be unlawful. So to conclude, Chairman, we shall have to soldier on. Leicestershire people expect and should get good services. We have to do all we can with the limited resources we have to give them what they want and need. In the coming months, we will leave no stone unturned to find the money to keep the council and its services running. In February, I will bring you a revised MTS, MTFS for the next four years. But don't expect miracles. It may be the toughest yet. Chairman, I move the motion on the order paper in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Rhodes. Uh, Mr Shepherd. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to second that. And uh, I'd first like to, to thank Byron for setting out before us so clearly our situation and our plans for the future. In that speech, every sentence made a telling point. I do, I do commend it to all, all of us. I'll just have I may draw out one or two points that Byron made just for even further emphasis. And the first is that we've been doing a lot to help ourselves, for example, financial control and our productivity. But we are still looking for others to give us the help that we deserve. I'll just quote, if I may, some words directly from Byron's speech. He said, but the major changes we had hoped for from government to social care and SEND funding have not been delivered. The most important change, fair funding, has been postponed yet again. We still look to government to give us the help that we need. He also mentioned our MPs and uh, what they've been doing, but he also mentioned that we've yet to see the outcome, the action from government. And as our MPs are fighting harder for us, I do hope they are making really clear to their constituents what the council situation is and the effect that our current funding situation has on the constituents who are the constituents quite obviously of our MPs and are ourselves. We serve MPs, borough councillors, parish councillors, county councillors, we're all say, serving the people of Leicestershire. And if only they would do what Byron commends, which is to adopt the Leicestershire model this afternoon, and that would really be a huge step forward. So, Chairman, I, I, I commend what Byron has said to, to all of us, clear, stark it had to be it sets out the situation we're in and the plans that we have thank you chairman mr shepherd uh i'll now call upon mr galton thank you madam chairman um and thank you for the opportunity to respond to this important uh debate um unfortunately mr rhodes paints a very depressing picture of the financial situation facing the County Council and therefore the residents of Leicestershire. Um, that one of being more cuts on top of the millions and millions of pounds of cuts that the Council has had to make over the last 10 years since austerity began. Uh, and, and really what he uh, is saying is that uh, as of today, he 
doesn't know, none of us know where this is going to end, what the outcome is going to be. We, we've, we've spent three, four years lobbying the government uh, through various ministers that, as he rightly says, have now moved on to other jobs, uh, all promised to look at the situation. We had, um, we don't do that now, but Mr Rhodes, numerous train journeys down to London to meet ministers and get our argument across. And at one point, I would acknowledge that it did look like the government was starting to listen and recognise the plight uh, and had promised to uh, do something about it. Now, whether it's COVID or whether just COVID or range of other issues, that is no longer the case. No business rates devolution further. Well, of course, that would be a two edged sword at the moment if um, more and more businesses are unable to pay. If it had been, um, if we'd been more dependent on business rates, that in itself could cause uh, a funding crisis for local government. But that's not happening at the moment, nor is fair funding, nor is there a resolution of the SEN funding crisis. And, and I asked at the scrutiny commission when Mr Rhodes came and made similar points to the ones he's made today. Well, how could it get any worse? We don't get any grant revenue support grant. That is gone. They took that away from us. And I think the answer was they would have to bring back negative RSG. Now, that would just be appalling if they went back to that, having said they wouldn't do it. And I think that if, you know, we've had significant assistance, as Mr Rhodes said, from the government, but surely it cannot be right that local government has to bear the financial consequences of dealing with a national crisis, an international crisis, in terms of responding to the pandemic, which we don't know when that is going to end, as we've been told today we're in for the wrong haul. If we have to cut local services to balance the books, I think the public is going to be extremely angry about that, on top of everything else that has had to be done. At this time, more than ever, people need local government services and support, the kind of things we've talked about this afternoon in terms of the community grants, the additional work being done at, by public health, um, the work we've done on transport to try and make it easier to walk and get about and cycle. Those are core local government services and functions. And if we have to cut those out, and make further cuts to things like libraries and all the things that people depend on as local services in order to balance the books. I, I just don't know what the reaction is going to be to that on top of everything we've had to do. So we need to carry on lobbying the government. We need the MPs to understand that we're not joking. We are not uh, pretending. Um, Mr Rhodes has said on a number of occasions that we are perilously close to not being able to meet our statutory, our statutory duties and obligations. Uh, and I think there's one thing I'd like to ask for today, as I'm sure the officers will, because they've got a responsibility. If, if when it comes to looking at further cuts as part of the MTFS, members need to be told very clearly where officers think this could lead to uh, 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 an inability of the council if we go down that route in the long term to deliver our statutory functions and duties. It needs to be clearly explained and brought out so that members understand, MPs understand and the public understand. So I'll leave it at that today. But in all, in, in total, I'm afraid Mr Rose has rather made me depressed about the financial situation even more than, than, than I was before I heard him speak today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Galton. Dr. Einan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in order to focus um, my, our response, uh, my response on behalf of the Labour Party, um, in taking this report, I wanted to look at what are we actually being asked to do. We're being asked to note the position this council is in financially, both in terms of revenue and capital. Uh, and I think Councillor Rhodes explained that well to note the effect of COVID-19 and to note the approach taken to updating the MTFS and the actions taken to mitigate the overspend. 
As the minor opposition group, we can hardly oppose noting the effect of COVID-19. Pandemic viruses are a bit like the mafia. They don't care to be ignored and will come round to your business bringing all their mates with them if you don't cooperate. Clearly, we do note the financial position. It is extremely serious and challenging, as it says in the paper. It was bad before COVID-19, with a funding gap of 39 million by 23-24, and it is worse now. At the beginning of lockdown, as I'm sure many will remember, this council was reassured by government promises that uh, to do whatever it takes. The staff of this council have done whatever it takes, but allowing for government grants, as it's clear from this paper, we are going to be £20 million, pounds, uh, million short due to COVID-19. That's another £20 million of stuff our staff aren't going to be able to do for the residents of Leicestershire. Paragraph 14, to me, says it all. The government is unlikely to be as sympathetic to council's financial plight in future years. How do we know that? Well, perhaps because this government haven't been exactly sympathetic in the last 10. It hasn't come up with a fair funding strategy for local government, despite being advised of a good one from Leicestershire. It hasn't come up with a funding strategy for social care. It hasn't sorted out special education needs funding and has also left a gap for young people with special educational needs aged 16 to 18 who need transport to get to school. It has spent 10 years stripping this council of funding, leaving it with no revenue support grant, reliant on council and business rates. And now, with the economy pitching on the edge of a pandemic abyss, and this council's financial position likely to get worse, it isn't suddenly going to have a change of heart. This report aims to balance the budget without a significant impact on services, and that is laudable. But there will be an impact, nevertheless. The reduction of 29 million investment in schools accommodation will not only affect the children and families of today, it will hold back a generation, limiting life chances and crippling our future economy. And the 75 million reduction capital funding for highways will set road improvements back a decade. And at this point, I need to thank Chris Tambini, Declan Keegan and all the officers of this council who have pulled out all the stops to deal with COVID-19 and keep this council from falling over financially. The Labour Group have enormous respect for all that you are doing. This report is an honest assessment of the problem and it's difficult not to be sympathetic. Discussing this paper amongst my group, we asked ourselves, what would we do differently if this was our budget? If we were in charge? If Labour were in control in Leicestershire and London, it would be a totally different budget. Uh, we would not have had 10 years of unnecessary austerity. We would not have, in 2012, fractured health and social care with a pointless reorganisation. And we might have placed public health in local government, but we wouldn't have bled it of funds, ignored the Cygnus report, and when the pandemic crisis came, that we should have prepared for and found the country lacking, we would not have passed the funding to test, trace and isolate to our mates in the private sector, ignoring the expertise of local government. <laughs> Surely, in an unprecedented situation, every government makes mistakes. Of course they do. But the mistakes they make are their own mistakes, driven by their own ideology. And a party whose most iconic 20th century leader was noted for saying there is no such thing as society, a party that cherishes personal freedom, privatisation and the pursuit of profit will make different mistakes from one that values the public sector ethos. So in the end, what the Labour group wish to note is this. The financial fa situation facing this council is not solely due to the impact of COVID-19. We have heard Councillor Rhodes say that Leicestershire MP should speak up for Leicestershire. We have heard the calls for fair funding. In paragraph 10, the paper advises that the financial situation also requires the government to deal with structural national issues. But in the final analysis, this is a conservative budget. These will be conservative service cuts. And the members who have spoken on this matter through membership of the Conservative Party, however often they complain, as members of the Conservative Party, I'm afraid they are complicit in the cause. So having noted that, the Labour Group will not be supporting this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Allenham. Uh, can I now call on Mr. Bill? Yes, picking up that um, point about noting, um, Madam Chairman, I think it might be it, Byron might consider 
strengthening that to say deploring the latest position because his um, uh, his talk was sobering and it, it's something that we, we we should all take on board. Um, going back to an earlier discussion, um, um, the leader um, had uh, took a swipe at me for using the word astonished. Perhaps I shouldn't have used that word and I withdraw it but because perhaps I've come to not expect anything better from from the way the um, the authority is now being being led. I mean, what what concerns me really is we we face an appalling internal situation, a situation which seems to deteriorate um, as we uh, as we uh, as we proceed, but we're not taking too much notice as far as i can see of the of the surrounding crises that um that we, we face some by some by accident and some by design the, we haven't mentioned climate change because the which is not going to go away it's going to overwhelm us we haven't mentioned the article which appeared, which took out, took up the first three pages of the Mercury on Saturday, and that is the the requirement now to think again, to think the strategic growth plan through again, and and for the county council to tell us where these alternative schemes are to to um, uh, to enable that to proceed, and we haven't mentioned the economic bombshell, brick wall, whatever you want to call it, which is about to hit us because we are making absolutely no progress with our logistics industry and the need to shift goods between this county and the continent. There's lots of talk about it, but we, we've just got a few days left now to sort that one out. And this county of ours is heavily committed and reliant on the logistics industry. And it's also reliant on manufacturing, more so in the West Midlands and ourselves. But the, the leaders of industry are crying out for assistance because they've been overlooked. We haven't sorted out this business of the cost of components for the car industry, just to pick one small item up. It's, it's, there's no progress on that. And because there's no progress, we're not only going to lose all, all, all these young people who are going to lose their work because furlough is coming to an end, is going to be compounded by the, by the crises, which I'm afraid this government has led us into, and of which he doesn't seem to have been producing any answers. Everybody has been distracted, of course, by COVID and sheer survival, but there are all kinds of other problems swimming around. And I think people are looking for the looking to the county council and looking to our MPs for a lead to to show us the way out of this. But it's not coming, and that's why there is such a distress. Well, I feel distressed about it, and I share Simon's pessimism. We're, we're, we're now all crying out for a lead. For goodness sake, show us a plan to get us through this lot, that, this problem that we're in. And there's no mention, no mention of these surrounding problems at all in these papers. And so perhaps I shouldn't have used the word astonished. Perhaps I should have word, used the word. I'm not surprised. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Uh, Mr. Mullaney, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Clearly, we are in serious financial difficulties as a county council, and this is inevitably going to see serious cutbacks to services and tax rises that are going to hit residents unless there's something radical that changes in the near future. Uh, the main thing being the need to get fair funding from the government. As, as Councillor Rhodes says, we're still the worst funded authority in Leicestershire. Now, we've all Tory MPs in Leicestershire, and at the moment, the government is trying to get through numerous controversial legislation to do with Brexit and COVID measures. 
This gives MPs a real opportunity to lobby the government and pressure them into um, agreeing to those MPs' requests. And certainly I would hope that our seven Conservative MPs will put a united front forward very vigorously to say we want to see this fair funding for Leicestershire and if you want our support on other issues then you need to start delivering for our residents in Leicestershire. It really isn't good enough that after all these years Leicestershire continues to be the worst funded county council in the country. We've had calls for fair funding for so many years and they've unfortunately never led to anything. And yes, we had Rishi Sunak on side. He's now in the top job, but he's not delivering either for us. It really is time that the seven Conservative MPs, in cooperation with the County Council leadership, lobby and hammer the government into delivering this fair funding. Because if it doesn't, then unfortunately, the lives of residents in Leicestershire are going to be made a lot worse if the County Council has to make further swinging cuts to important services over the future years. Thank you, Mr. Mullaney. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison, are you still muted? Hopefully not, Madam Chairman. Um, I started by saying I share most of the concerns of members. It's quite natural when uh, we're dealing with situations that we are, that we have this element of concern. I think we also have to be quite realistic and not sort of make political play on this. Uh, Terry was quite political, but if she lived in Wales, and was enduring the National Health Service run by the Labour government there, perhaps it wouldn't be quite so happy. I think this afternoon is a good example for all of us. We were taught very briefly about a way forward. All the members who've spoke today said, well, what are we going to do and who's doing what? We talked about a constructive way forward it was a unitary that would save 30 to 40 millions a year. And yet it was all, no, it's not quite right. This isn't right. There are ways in which we can be constructive to move forward. If we feel this great need and concern, that's really the only game in town. You don't think the government's going to say, well, this is fantastic with all the other constraints internationally and world we're suffering the economies in serious difficulty because of the pandemic. There's a whole range of things that are building up. This is a real massive coming together of all the problems you could ever dream of happening. So we have to be realistic as politicians. Yes, we're very sad. Yes, we are concerned. But there is a potential door that can open if we're prepared to look. We talk of representing and working on behalf of the 700,000 people in Leicestershire. That's fine. We have an appalling situation. But in the other hand, there potentially is a way forward. Now, that might not be palatable to everybody. But are we talking about we as individual politicians or are we talking collectively as a county council which is our responsibility to find ways in which we can improve our financial position quite dramatically. So that would be my contribution, Madam Chairman. Yes, I acknowledge the concern. We all do. But it's not sitting and bemoaning the concerns. Misery loves company. We've got to do something about it. And we have to sit back and think, how are we going to work and build our way forward? At the moment, in my perspective, there's only one game in town where we could actually build a situation where we can fund our vital services that every member in this council this afternoon 
desires and wants that to be so. Well, from having a desire and an ambition, we need to start thinking seriously about how we can react to that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harrison. Uh, there are no more speakers, so I can now call upon Mr. Rhodes to reply to some of the comments. Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I'm pleased for, in a precarious sort of way to hear that uh, every council councillor who's spoken actually agrees with the assessment that we've put forward in the paper and I've described uh, in my in my speech. It's no comfort, but at least we, we have agreement on that. Of course, the opposition councillors um, feel that uh, more blame should be attached to the government and being a Conservative government, I can understand why they should say that. The vital thing we have to do now, and what I want to, 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 be, to, to come out of this meeting um, and to go out to the wider public, is that to get out of this, we, are, we all have to pull together. That's the county council, the district councils, and the borough councils, and the MPs. And the MPs, I think, have not done as much as they could, and, they, and in the future they must do much more. They have to stand shoulder to shoulder with us in getting this put right. So the most important thing we have to do, and which we should set our, our minds to and unite together to make it happen, is to get fair funding done. That's the message I'd like to go out from this meeting. Get fair funding done. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr Rhodes. Um, I am advised that several members have indicated they were not supportive of the motion. I will therefore ask Lauren to do a roll call. Could members indicate whether they are for or against the motion? And can you unmute yourself just before your name is due to be called? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Barclay. For. For. Mr. Benjamin. Mr. Benjamin. For. Mr. Bill. Against. Mr. Blunt. Four. Mr. Bolter. Mr. Bolter. Against. Was that was that me, Laura? I can hardly hear you. Is is Mr. Bray Mr. against? Bray. Against. Thank you. I'm in difficulty Bray. hearing you, Lauren. Uh, I've, got, I've heard you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brecken. Four. Dr. Bremner. Four. Audley. Again. Against. Mr. Charlesworth. Against. Lauren, I can't hear you at all. Could, could members please um, make sure they're unmuted, sorry, muted, so that, um, as I think that's affecting the sound quality for everybody. I think there are quite a lot of members with microphones. Still. So, we're, 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 Mr. Coxon. I'll come back to it. Mr. Crooks, I think, has given apologies. Is that right? And then Dr. Einan. Ab abstain. Dr. Felton. Lauren, Lauren, it seems to be when you're not speaking directly at the microphone, we can't hear you. Okay, yeah, I can't hear you. Dr. Felton. Four. Mrs. Pryor. Thank you. Four. Mr. Galton. Against. Mr. 
approval. Her microphone. Mr. Gamble. I'll come he's, back to. He's left. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gillard. Four. Mrs. Hack. Abstain. Mr. Harrison. Four. Dr. Hill. Against. Mr. Hunt. Abstain. Mr. Kaufman. Against. Mr. Licorice. Four. Mr. Mia. Abstain. Morgan. Four. Laney. Against. Newton. Abstain. Roche. Mr. Orson. Four. Osborne said apologies, isn't he? I think. Um, Mr. Old. Four. Age. Four. Mr. Payne. Four. Four. Mr. Pearson. Four. Pendleton. Four. Fillimore. Four. Poland. Four. Mrs. Radford. Four. Rhodes. Four. I'm very sorry to interrupt you, Lauren, but my name wasn't calling. You, you can Can't say four. Are you talking to me, Lauren? Should, should I just finish the list and I'll come back and read out any any names that haven't um, people who haven't responded. Mr. Parton, I'll just check. Did you say for or against? I am for. Thank you. Mrs. Richards. Mrs. Richards. Four. Thank you. Richardson. Four. Oh. Mrs. Richardson. Four. Mr. Rushton. Uh, four, Lauren, but your microphone, to be fair to members, is actually very, very bad. You only hear every other word. It, it may well be faulty, Lauren. Yes, I think it must be. I'm sorry about that, members. I'm just struggling. I think this is hopefully the last time I'll need to use it um, today and we'll have it looked at. Uh, Mrs. Seaton. Four. Ian. Mr. Sheehan. Abstain. Thank you. Mr. Shepherd. Four. Mrs. Taylor. Four. Welsh. Okay. Mrs. A. Wright. Four. Mrs. M. Wright. Four. And Mr. Wyatt. Against. Thank you. Four. There are 33 members who have voted in favour. 11 against. 11 against. 
six and six abstentions. So the um, motion is carried. Thank you very much. We now move on to agenda item number seven, um, appointment of independent persons. Mr. Rhodes will move and Mrs. Wright will sec Mrs. M. Wright will second. That Mr. Mr. Grant, Mr. G. Grimes, Miss T. Herring, Mrs. H. Katecha, Professor S. Sharma, and Miss P. Roberts be appointed to serve as independent persons for a term of four years, ending on the 30th of September 2024. That this council's appreciation to be conveyed to the outgoing independent persons in supporting the authority to uphold standards with elected members and the senior chief officers. So, Mr Rhodes, if you'd like to move, please. Yeah, yes, uh, Chairman, thank you for that. Um, I chaired the uh, interview panel, uh, all member interview panel, um, that, uh, that interviewed a number of candidates for these positions on behalf of uh, Mr Rushton, who was away on other council business. And I'm pleased to move the motion which you have just read out. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, Mrs. Wright? Yes, I am pleased to second the motion, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. The following members have asked to speak. Mr. Galton? Just to say we support the proposals, uh, Madam Chairman. There's nothing more I need to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Einan? Uh, thank you, Chair, and the Labour Group also support the proposals. We thank the previous incumbents and uh, support the appointment of the new incumbents and thank them for their willingness to take up this role and also thank the panel uh, and the uh, uh, and thank them for the coordination with the Fire Authority. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr Einan. Mrs Newton. Yes, Terry said everything I would wish to say. I, I was very impressed with the calibre of the candidates. And as you said, this was your joint venture with the CFA. We spent a whole day interviewing. And as I said, um, I think we have a good panel to choose from. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Newton. There are no uh, other speakers. So is the motion agreed? Yes, fine. Thank you very much. That motion is agreed. Now, move on to agenda item eight, notices of motion, um, which is sky lanterns and helium balloons. And Mr. J. Orson um, will seek the approval of the council to move the following altered motion. Mr. Orson will move and Mrs. Richardson will second. OK, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I start this that moving this motion is basically the basic problem with um, sky lanterns and helium balloons are what goes up must come down. And that is the basic problem that, that they both create. Um, many organisations have uh, drawn attention to the problems of sky lanterns and the helium balloon releases. And this is not the first call um, to ban the, the launching of council property at all. Um, a number of local district councils already do it and also a number of um, county councils do that already. Um, it is supported by the Marine Conservation Society, the RSPCA, the RSPB, the BASC and also the National Farmers Union. Uh, the release of Sky Lanterns, I have to say, I can remember seeing the first one many, many years ago and I thought what a, an impressive sight it was myself. Um, but there are dangers with them, as you well know, and there is simply no way in predicting where they will land. And also the same with helium balloons. Um, you just don't know where they're going to land. Um, as I said, a number of UK local authorities have already to agreed to implement a ban and on their land, so that we would not be the first. But there are increasing concerns with the dangers of sky lanterns and helium balloons. There is currently no UK legislation available to control this issue, but in order to demonstrate the Council's continued commitment to, to continue um, the attractiveness of Leicestershire and tackling the detrimental impact of the debris of the balloons and the lanterns can cause, I do propose um, the motion at number eight, number eight, eight E. 
the Sky Lanterns are essentially, it's a small hot air balloon made of paper. And it's got an opening at the bottom uh, where a candle is suspended. And Sky Lanterns can and do float for miles before they do fall to the ground. And um, causing a danger to animals and a fire hazard. So it's not just litter, but it can be burning litter. So the risks are litter nuisance. Farmers and landowners, I have found them myself, by the way, on my little bit in Old Dolby. Um, uh, helium balloons are probably slightly more common than the, the lanterns nowadays, but they have to be cleared up uh, from the fields. And don't be fooled, by the way, by bamboo lanterns marked by a degradable. They can still take decades to degrade, and that is reality. There's a massive fire risk, of course. Um, as I said, they do tend to come down. We don't know exactly where a sky lantern can come down, but it can land on a standing crop. It can stand on uh, land on hay straw stacks, farm buildings, housing, animals, thatch roofs, and it, the list just goes on. Animals and livestock, massive risk there. Uh, sky lanterns and helium balloons can both cause great suffering uh, to animals and livestock. Uh, not just by fire, by the way, but by um, eating uh, the debris caused, and that, that can cause tears and punctures of internal organs to animals. Animals can also get splinters in their skin as well from the sky lanterns. And animals also, by the way, cattle and sheep, both very nervous creatures, so something that's a little bit alien to them, and they can panic, and then they, they will run, and or some people will call it a stampede, but they they do panic and then they can get tangled or trapped in barbed wire and um, they can also get trapped in the, the debris as well. Uh, the frames of the lanterns can also contaminate the crops. Now you have to remember most crops in the UK are actually grown for the animal feed. So you can get contamination in the animal feed chain. And again, so six months on, you can still have problems with sky lanterns. I'm also informed that sky lanterns do pose a significant danger to aviation traffic, such as planes and helicopters. I'm reading this bit. There are concerns that lanterns can be drawn into aircraft engines and can delay taking off and landing. In addition, lan lanterns drifting across the night sky are also commonly mistaken by the public and coast guards for marine distress signals. All of this culminates, of course, in extra demands on our blue light emergency services. So thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to say a few words, and I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say in response. Thank you, uh, Mr. Orson. Uh, Mrs. Richardson. Thank you, Chair. I'm uh, happy to second. Um, I agree the lanterns look very beautiful, but they are extremely dangerous as we have no knowing where they're going to land. And in rural areas, the fires can take hold long before um, they're noticed. But it isn't just a problem for farmers and for livestock. It is the thatched houses, business premises, and our domestic pets can all be affected. And I have read that at one, of, one particular fire, there were over 200 firefighters needed to uh, put the fire out. Again, I echo the um, issues about uh, aviation because we have an airport um, in our vicinity. And as a number of councils have already looked at this and banned this, I do. Um, I am happy to se uh, second this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson. Um, I'd like now to call upon Mrs. Newton, please. I didn't put my hand up to speak. You must still have your hand up from last time then. Sorry, but I've got your name down to speak. So, uh, Dr. Einan. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I thank um, Councillor Olson for bringing this motion and for Councillor Richardson. I think they have explained very well what the problems are with these products. Um, not only what must go up must come down, not only fire, but also this is litter. Um, it's a danger to domesticated animals, it's a danger to wild animals. And uh, 
it needs to really be seen as part of this council's overall strategy for the environment. We wish to prevent waste. We wish to look after our environment. I have uh, read the industry representatives document where they've argued against this. They have argued that their products can be made safe. They have said that um, that the products uh, in this country are, are made safe and it's all those uh, products being uh, brought in from abroad that aren't. Um, so I'm really pleased that at the uh, amended version of this motion that we are arguing to control, to regulate this industry. Um, I am not absolutely sure that sky lanterns could ever be made safe. Clearly, they are carrying fire. Um, and just like fireworks aren't exactly safe either for the same reasons that they can carry a fire into someone, the roof space of someone's house and uh, and burn down their dwelling. Um, so whether they, they can be made safe, I'm not sure. But certainly he helium balloons. For me, there is no excuse uh, for not making these things safe. Um, as all single-use plastics need to change. We cannot carry on as a society uh, making uh, plastics out of oil, making plastic products that then like crisp packets, um, like the rings that uh, hold cans of uh, four cans of beer together, uh, strangling animals um, when they are cast aside uh, willy-nilly in, in, in the countryside. So this has got to be part of a, a much bigger strategy, which is why, of course, the Labour group are very pleased to support this motion. Um, it, it is now possible to make uh, single-use plastics uh, out of pea protein, out of um, uh, potato starch and even out of fruit waste. And it is now possible, I understand, um, to make single-use plastics that are edible. And there does need to be a point when any child who is picking up a balloon in the in the town centre, you can't always guarantee the little darlings will keep hold of it, um, that they need to know that when that balloon is accidentally lost in the, in the atmosphere, that wherever it comes down, it will not just be recyclable or biodegradable. And we know what weasel words those can be, but genuinely edible. Um, and so uh, absolutely no harm to domesticated stock um, or to wildlife in this country. So I'm very pleased uh, uh, to support this motion, as I'm sure all my Labour colleagues will. Thank you for bringing it. Thank you, Dr. Annan. Mr. Parton. Having looked at the Countryside Online Alliance, they have a very good website which lists in detail uh, pretty much every argument that Mr. Rawson has given. And it's interesting to note that looking at the list of councils that have agreed to ban the use of these, our colleagues in the city and also our rural colleagues in Rutland have already done so. So we will be showing a degree of consistency in Leicestershire should we also do this. There was a serious fire at the Smethwick recycling plant near West Bromwich. And as the a member of the fire authority, we have to always consider what, uh, where are the risks. Um, we have a lot of P's. We have protection, prevention, and something that causes such a serious fire. Uh, as a Leicestershire fire authority, we we have to work hard to prevent such blatant instances of a totally avoidable fire. So we as a county council would be showing a lot of consistency. And finally, when you look, when one looks at the, the list of councils where it already has been banned, a lot of them are rural. And obviously they are experiencing and have already experienced the same problems that Mr Rawson has articulated. And given that our county has a considerable amount of, of countryside, which is we're very grateful for, but also farmland, especially towards um, the east of the county, this is something that we sh really should be doing for the reasons that Mr Orson's given, but also for a totally needless and preventable fires that, that we need, um, as a member of the fire authority, we certainly need to, to stop immediately. Thank you, Mr Parton. Mr Bray. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just very briefly, just something that the Liberal Democrat group will support. Um, this this was this went through unanimously at Hinkley and Bosworth, a similar motion back in March. So uh, pleased to be consistent to vote for it here as well as a county councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Congratulate the mover and seconder for bringing the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr Bray. Uh, I take it that we are all in favour of agreeing this motion. There are nobody that wishes to disagree. Thank you very much. Then the motion is carried. At 05, I think it is, um, I would like to call this meeting to a close. Thank you all for your attendance. Although we've not met in person, it has been nice to see pictures of the people that I don't come across very often. So take care, everybody, and keep safe. Good night. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Good night, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Good night.